This program is made possible in part by AARP South Carolina. ETV, the state newspaper, the Greenville News, in association with the Island Packet, the Beaufort Gazette, the Florence Morning News, the Sun News of Myrtle Beach, the Herald of Rock Hill, and the Sumter Item present ETV Debates. Tonight, candidates for Lieutenant Governor. And now, your moderator, Charles Bierbauer, Dean of USC's College of Mass Communication and Information Studies. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Lieutenant Governor debate. We also want to welcome our ETV radio listeners. Joining me tonight to ask questions of the candidates is Andrew Shane of the State Newspaper. And the candidates joining us this evening are Henry McMaster, a Republican from Columbia, and Bakari Sellers, a Democrat from Denmark. Before we begin tonight, some ground rules. Each candidate will have the opportunity to make a one-minute opening statement, and from there they will have 90 seconds to answer our questions. If necessary, I will allow a 30-second rebuttal. We do names when the candidates arrive for the order in which we will start. Mr. Sellers, we will begin with your opening statement. Good evening. My name is Bakari Sellers, and I am from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina. From the past 15 to 16 months, I've been traveling the state, meeting some beautiful people. And at every stop, I always tell people what my parents taught me to be the two most important words in the English language, the words thank you. So tonight I want to start by thanking the many who are watching at home, listening on the radio, for taking time out to join us today. I want to thank ETV and its hosts for giving us this forum. I also want to thank my opponent, Henry McMaster. For the past five months, we've, Henry has refused to debate us or join us on any political stages. So I'm thankful that you joined us today. This race is not about what South Carolina was or what it is. It's about what South Carolina can be. This race is about our seniors who are growing quicker and quicker into poverty, who on Monday mornings have to make decisions about whether or not they pay for their utility bills or get their prescription drugs. This race is about those young people who have to walk through the mud when it rains to go to their trailers just to get to their kindergarten class. This race is about all of those South Carolinians who have just simply given up hope and dropped out of the labor market. This race is for all of us who fundamentally believe that we can do better. Thank you. Mr. McMaster. My thanks as well. I'm happy to be here. I'm running because I love South Carolina. But ladies and gentlemen, that's not enough. You've got to be qualified to serve as Lieutenant Governor. It's an underutilized office, and I intend to change that. But there are qualifications required. One is the lieutenant governor has to run the office on aging. That's a big statewide office with an important function. I've run two such offices, the attorney general's office for eight years, and Ronald, as Ronald Reagan's U.S. attorney, the U.S. attorney's office for four years. Also, the lieutenant governor presides over the Senate presiding over 46 senators, some powerful, been there for a long time, not easy. They must have respect for that person in order to get things done. Finally, the lieutenant governor may have to step in for the governor in case something happens. I'm prepared to do all of those things. I have the experience, the judgment, the maturity, and I'm qualified and I offer my candidacy because I think our best days are ahead. Gentlemen, thank you. This is the last freestanding election for South Carolina's lieutenant governor. In 2018, you'd be running as a ticket with the governor and lieutenant governor running together. So this evening, be your own man. What issue is uniquely yours, regardless of where Governor Haley or Senator Shaheen may stand on it? Mr. Sellers. Well, thank you for asking that question, Charles. Uh, what's most important for this job in every single day when I'm elected, starting January 15th, I'm going to focus on our seniors. We've laid out a six-point plan for our seniors. The first thing we want to do is make sure they have access to quality transportation. Within the first 100 days, we'll work with the Department of Transportation and others to build a universal transportation plan so that seniors, for example, who live in North Augusta, don't have to worry about how they're going to get to a doctor in Aiken. That's essential. That's first and foremost. The second thing we want to do is we want to talk to seniors and caregivers about tax relief. We want to offer a $500 tax credit for our seniors, many of which who are paying for these things when they care, excuse me, caregivers, they're paying for their, taking care of their seniors out of their own pocket. We also want to provide a $350 tax credit for those caregivers who are paying those long-term insurance policy premiums. The third thing we want to do is raise the homestead exemption from $50 to $65,000. The fourth thing we want to do on day one, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to sign a memorandum of understanding I'm going to sign that memorandum with the U.S. Attorney, with the Attorney General and the Chief of SLED, and we're going to protect our seniors from frauds and scams. 
Number five, we're going to strengthen the continuum of care. Unfortunately, we're 41st. Under Governor Nikki Haley and others, we're 41st in the way that we fund our in-home and community-based programs. I also want to restore the $400,000 worth of Medicaid cuts to nursing home beds that we've had under this administration. And the last thing, and it's not because it's the least important, but actually it may be the most important, I want to be a staunch advocate for Alzheimer's research and funding, making South Carolina number one in the way that we move forward with that research. All right, thank you. I fully expected we would get to the question of, of the Office on Aging, but Mr. McMaster, the question to you was, what is uniquely your issue as you come into this uh, final days of this campaign? Well, I think it's one of experience. It's uh, Dean Beerbauer. Uh, this office has been, in my opinion, underutilized over the years. The Lieutenant Governor's Office is the second highest office in South Carolina. And what that means is that the governor and the lieutenant governor have the same jurisdiction. Now, certainly one thing that the lieutenant governor must do is run the office on aging. Well, I'm the one among us who has actually run a statewide agency before. One is the attorney general's office for eight years, and we got a lot of things done. We got a lot of laws passed. We made life a little bit better for South, Carolina, South Carolinians. But also, it's important to have the judgment and the wisdom that comes with working in the Senate, working in the House, working to get things done for the people. I guess the most important thing that's going to be different this time, understanding that the lieutenant governor and the governor have the same jurisdiction. They are the only two statewide, the only two officials in state government that have the whole broad spectrum of opportunities and challenges directly in front of them as their jurisdiction. This will be the first time that we've had a governor and lieutenant governor who are ready, willing, and able to work together as a team to get things done for South Carolina. Sure, this is the last time we'll be electing the lieutenant governor, but I look forward more to being known as being involved in the, as the first lieutenant governor to have an active working relationship with the governor to get things done for the people of this state, and I've got a record of doing that. Well, you, you may have been looking at my questions, because my next question really was, was in what way are you a surrogate for the candidate at the top of your, your party ticket? Let's start with you, Mr. McMaster. Well, in no way. The, the lieutenant governor is a separate office. Uh, it has duties that are imposed by the Constitution, which is to preside over the Senate, and also uh, in recent years to run the office on aging. Uh, that's the lieutenant governor's responsibility. But as I say, those are, those are just the beginning there are all sorts of other things with the economy, with uh, ethics uh, rules and regulations that we have to pass. If our people don't have confidence in the legislators, if they don't have confidence in the public officials, then government won't work. Governor Haley asked me to chair the ethics, uh, the state ethics commission, uh, the reform commission with Attorney General Travis Medlock, and we got a lot done. We've got to restore the confidence of the people in the ethics of those who are serving them in government. We've also got to work on education. The lieutenant governor could help with that. We have also have a problem with the, our economy. Governor Haley has done a magnificent job of getting things going. We, we, I mean, things are happening in South Carolina, but we've got to work hard and remember this, most of the problems that we have in this state go away when we have, when people have jobs. We've got problems with poverty. We've got problems with children in the third grade who can't read at a third grade level. We got drug problems. We got gang problems. We got plenty of problems. All of those things can be addressed and uh, uh, addressed by the Lieutenant Governor and he can be an advocate in those areas and I intend to do that. Mr. Sellers, a uh, surrogate for Senator Shaheen? Well, no, we, we have our own unique responsibilities, and I'm glad that uh, Henry has laid out many of the problems that we still have facing our great state. Now, let me tell you a story about a young woman named Nicole Rivers. Um, Nicole works at Voorhees College, and one day I was going to Voorhees to visit my dad, and Nicole ran up and gave me a big hug. And the reason that she wrapped her arms around me, it was rather emotional. She stepped back and she said, you know, my son, Sinclair, he actually has a job now. I want to thank you for Masonite, which came to Bamberg County, which came to Denmark. The irony in this discussion about experience is that I'm the only person standing on this stage that's actually created a job for someone other than themselves. During my tenure, we created 2,800 jobs in Bamberg, Barnwell, Orangeburg County. Now, I will tell you that I can't take credit, like the governor does, for all those jobs, but I've been in that room before. And that's the irony in this whole discussion about experience. 
Henry will tell you about 30 or 40 years worth of experience, but he cannot tell you one job that he's created for someone other than himself. Yes, I'm not a surrogate for Vincent Shaheen, but yes, I've actually passed legislation, contrary to my opponent. And yes, I've actually created jobs for people, contrary to my opponent. So we have an, an experience discussion, and the irony is I'm some 30 years the junior, but I think I actually bring more experience to the table. Andy. Okay. That leads into my next question. You know, you both have set separate visions for yourselves uh, during this, this campaign, but I'm going to go ahead and turn that around. Uh, Mr. McMaster, how do you represent a break from the norm in South Carolina? Well, <clears throat> it's about vision. It's about seeing the big picture. It's about understanding that most of our problems come from a, a lack of, of jobs. P if people, when people have good paying jobs, then a lot of these other problems go, go away. But what, what I bring is a, is a vision for the future. I see South Carolina is uniquely situated in this country to lead the way. I see nothing stopping us except our own willpower and the willingness to do a few things to make things go even better. I believe that the economy is getting ready to really grow. I think the economy is getting ready to explode, and I know it's going to be in the southeast, and I believe it's going to be ground-centered in South Carolina. We have a magnificent port, one of the best in a few years, uh, Char the Port of Charleston and the Port of New York, and New Jersey will be the dominant, those will be the dominant two ports on the southeast. We also have a second to none educational system, a technical education system. We got to rev that up. We've got a right to work law and a right to work attitude. We have research universities that are breaking out with innovation and collaborating with these businesses like Bowen and Michelin and others that are, are coming here. We've got it all. The only thing standing in our way is an antiquated tax structure and, our, and the ethics and things that we can solve ourselves just with the stroke of a pen. So what I bring is that vision for the future and the big difference between me and my opponent, if I've gotten these things done before and I know how to do it and I'm ready to do it some more. And to you, Mr. Sellers, how do you have a record of accomplishments and experience that best serves um, in this statewide position? Well, well, thank you. And we articulated that somewhat in our last answer because when I was able to look in that young woman's eyes and she was talking about her son, I was able to see the pride and dignity that her son actually had from coming along with the job. And again, I'll reiterate that Henry McMaster has not created a job for anybody other than himself. But see, South Carolina, and I, and I keep saying this throughout the state, it's not about what it was or what it is, it's about what it can be. This, is a, this race is the clearest contrast of any race in the entire state. We have old ideals and ideas from the 1986 U.S. senatorial candidates, candidacy to the 1990 lieutenant governor's race to the 2010 governor's race. It's the same ideas. We need to turn the page on that. We simply do. We have to think about the future of South Carolina. It's kids that are depending on us. It's seniors that are depending on us. It's people who need jobs. I know that Henry McMaster talked about all the, those jobs that were coming to South Carolina, but one thing he failed to mention is that individuals in South Carolina are dropping out of the labor force at a rate faster than any other state in the union. That means people are giving up hope. I want South Carolinians to believe and understand that I represent the hope for tomorrow, the hope for the future. Henry McMaster, if there's any politician in the state that represents yesterday, it's him. Rebuttal. You, <laughs> you may. Okay. The two public offices I've held, one was United States Attorney under Ronald Reagan. Held that for four years. We made a lot of progress. The second was in 2002, you elected me as Attorney General. And I ran without opposition four years later, so that was eight years. Those jobs are prosecutors' jobs. And the job of, the, of a, the chief prosecutor of South Carolina is to take care of the people. And I did that. I had great staffs in both places. We made progress. We got laws passed for gangs. We got laws passed for securities legislation. Got laws passed for environmental grand juries. We got a lot of laws passed and made people safe. I created the jobs for some people. They were in jail, federal prison and state prison. Cre <laughs> created plenty of them, too. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMaster said in a recent interview, you will never hear me apologize for South Carolina. Representative Sellers, is there anything with South Carolina that you would apologize for? I, I beam with pride about this great state. Look, let me give you an example of how great our state is. You have an Indian American who comes from Bamberg, South Carolina, who beats all the boys, including Henry McMaster, and ascends to the highest title in government to be governor. That's South Carolina. 
you had my father, who was shot February 8, 1968, in the Orange Rock Massacre. And not only shot, but in prison. There are no jobs in prison, Mr. McMaster. I'm sorry. But not only that, but now you have before you the son of that civil rights hero running for lieutenant governor. That's South Carolina. South Carolina is not red or black. South Carolina is not red or blue, excuse me, or black or white or Democrat or Republican. South Carolina are all those good people. South Carolina is, is Dick Riley. South Carolina is, is Fritz Hollings. South Carolina is Carol Campbell. South Carolina is what we have to restore. It's that pride and dignity. It's why I wake up every morning and I, and I get on this journey to run for office. It's why I came outside to campaign. That is what South Carolina is. It's good people. It's natural resources. It's beauty. Mr. McMaster, it's the same question, and you, you raised a number of issues that South Carolina has some challenges that it has. Is there not something that, that maybe the state you need to apologize for? No, sir. Not, not for this state, not for the people of this state. This uh, state has been here from the very beginning. It was one of the original colonies, as you remember, and we've had to fight our way all, all the way. And today, uh, I'm, I'm more proud of the people of this state than, than I could, could ever be. We have overcome a lot. We've got a long way to go in a lot of areas. But I am confident that in the future, starting, uh, actually, Governor Haley in her economic development quest, which has been enormously successful, has started this right in the midst of a severe recession. But we're coming out of that now. So the next four years are going to be golden for South Carolina. That's what I see. The next four years, we're going to be so proud of what we're going to do for the people of this state. They are good people. They've endured much. They're ready. They're determined. And the, with the resources we have, with the assets we have, there's no reason why we can't achieve everything that we want. We're at the bottom of some lists. I think we can go and be on the top. All we have to do is determine that that is what we're going to do, elect the right leadership, have the right leadership in business and other, in the other professions, and we can go to the top in South Carolina. And I believe this, because of our size, because of our mobility, because people in South Carolina have the right attitude and know each other, I believe we can be a model for the United States. That's what I intend to do. Gentlemen, I said we'd come back to the, the uh, issue of aging and specifically because the lieutenant governor heads the office on aging. Uh, I want to start with you this time, uh, Mr. McNaster, and, and then switch back. Um, about a year ago, then Lieutenant Governor Glenn McConnell participated in a forum at, at USC on some of the issues associated with aging. He described what for him had been almost an awakening when he became lieutenant governor in discovering the scope of South Carolina's aging problem and the prospects. He called it a tsunami. Uh, so is it a tsunami and is the Office on Aging ready for that? Yes, it is a tsunami. No, the Office on Aging is not ready for that. When I was in the Attorney General's office, we had an episode, had a case involving a lot of our senior citizens up in the upstate. It's called the Home Gold Carolina Investors Case, where a couple of thousand, uh, no, it was about uh, it was over thousands of people had lost 200 and something million dollars in their savings accounts that they'd put in a, into an institution up there. We didn't have the authority to investigate that. The grand jury authority, state grand jury, did not go that far. I went to the legislature, one of them was Glenn McConnell, and I, I got to say this, when I say South Carolina can move when we want to move, within about 45 minutes I leave in his office, a bill had been read across the desk in the Senate and that got it started. We got the authority. It was the largest white collar case in South Carolina history. We found the six people responsible for doing that and convicted them all. The old, the, 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 the old rules don't apply anymore. We're in a new day where we have computers. There are things that we can do, but we've got to take care of our senior citizens. We've got to help them. There's so many that are just barely hanging on. I want to work to see that they are safe, happy, and secure in their own homes as long as they want to stay there. We can have volunteers helping. We need to, we need to increase that the homestead exemption. We need to take down the income taxes. We need to freeze property taxes or maybe cut them. Many things we can do, and I'm ready. Mr. Sullivan, it's really the same question. Yeah. Is it a tsunami? Is it, the office prepared to deal it, with it? Seniors are facing a great crisis in this state. They're our fastest growing population. 
And earlier this evening, I gave you my plan for seniors, a vision. But volunteers are no solution. Hoping that someone comes and maybe picks up a senior to take them to their doctor's appointment or to church, that's not a vision. You know, volunteers being caregivers and having to do it out their own pocket without any support from the state, that's not a vision. We have to have someone with a plan to lead this state forward. Our seniors deserve that. You know what, Charles, our seniors deserve more than volunteer efforts. Every single day, every single day that I am Lieutenant Governor, my focus, like a laser, is going to be on the seniors of this great state. I, I have to. There was my, my great aunt, Jenny Marie Sellers. We took her to, uh, she was in Shadow Oaks Nursing Home and she used to love to go to Ryan's. Love to go to Ryan's. And every time we would go to Ryan's, she, she loved it because of their soft serve ice cream. But every time we would go to Ryan's after she figured out who I was, she would say, you're, you're Bakari, right? And she's like, you're the one in law school. And I say, yes, ma'am, Aunt Jenny. And she say, make sure you grow up and be a good lawyer and not a good liar. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'll do my best. But I looked at her in the eyes and I said, you know what? That is why I'm running for lieutenant governor. I'm running for all of those women who have, men and women who have strived so hard, our veterans who have worked so hard so that I could stand on this stage today. And I promise you, I will give you much more than a volunteer effort. I want to narrow the focus on the senior issue to the health care question. And, and each of you has, has made some comments in that direction. But what, what would you say is the primary need and how are you going to fund it? Is, for example, Medicaid still an option, even though Governor Haley has declined to accept the, that expansion of Medicaid? Let me start with, with you on this one, uh, Mr. Sellers. Well, there's no doubt that I believe we should expand Medicaid. But let me give you an idea. And this is what that legislative experience would get you, Henry. But let me give you an idea. What happens if we took the $107 million surplus that we have every single year from the General Assembly? and put that in a pot of money. And then we take the monies that we realize from our savings, the Department of Administration, or the consolidation of state agencies, and you put that in a, money, in, a, in a pot of money. And then we close a few of those sales tax exemptions. Let's say we close the one that has a sales tax exemption on lottery tickets, and maybe the one where you get a sales tax exemption for porta potties. Let's identify $100 million and put that in a pot of money. There you have $300 million. Let's dedicate one out of every three of those dollars to our roads and bridges one out of every three of those dollars to our public schools, and one out of every three of those dollars to our seniors. What you have is a billion dollars over a 10-year period, a billion dollars over a 10-year period without raising a single tax. That's an idea. That's vision for the future. That's a bill that I actually sponsored this year. But yes, if that doesn't pass, then yes, I want to stand up and say we need to expand Medicaid. Our seniors deserve it. Those who say, and Governor Haley said, that she would not, she didn't say just that we will not expand Medicaid, she said never. That's turning your back. 59% of the people who are on Medicaid, 59% of the people on Medicaid are children. 7% are our seniors. 13% are disabled. That's 79% of the population that we're turning our back on if we don't expand Medicaid. So I didn't give you just one, but I gave you two solutions. Mr. McMaster, is, is the volunteer effort that you talk about sufficient to supplant uh, the money that's not going to come out of, of an expanded Medicaid, or is there another uh, another option that you have? Well, I measure progress not by how many people are on Medicaid, but how many people don't need Medicaid. That is, how many are working, who have good paying jobs, and as I've said before in my experience, a good paying job, meaningful work, is, is starts, the, reverses the cycle of despair and dependency, reverses it, and brings strong sturdy citizens who want to go to work and are proud of their state. So we don't want to expand Medicaid. There, there are other things that we can do that are better than Medicaid. One way we could save a lot of money, again, is, is these new, uh, the computer systems and programs that are coming out. There's a telemedicine program where you can have a doctor come to your house. If you've got a cell phone, you can, you can look at the doctor and you can show him your hurt arm or show him your hurt eye. Uh, have a, a conversation there 24 hours a day. There are a number of companies out that are doing that now. Why don't we do something like that? We can do the same thing with psychiatry. We could cut they, the, med, the cost. We could use the Medicaid money doing those kind of things, and we'd have plenty of money. 
The idea, it's a bad old idea that does not work to expand government. And that's what my opponent and those of, in his party very often talk about. I don't want to make government bigger. One way not to make it bigger is to use volunteers. There are volunteers and policemen that go around, police officers that go to these homes and check on people. There are youthful volunteers that would like to help. We could, we collaborate among the agencies we have, have volunteers, save a lot of money and new, use new ideas is and we get the job done. Thank you. If, Thank I, you. if I may, um, I can't let this pass. We we di actually 30, did have 30 a, seconds. We actually did have a, a, a pilot program for telepsychiatry in Bamberg County. You know that hospital shut down and we would be able to reopen it if we expanded Medicaid. But more importantly, the hypocrisy of that statement, it fills the room. It's overwhelming. Henry, you were one of three out of nine Ports Authority board members who opted in to receiving state insurance. So when you get sick, you get to go and give your insurance card to the doctor. But when somebody gets sick in Greenville or Charleston or Horry County, they're on the brink of bankruptcy. Not only that, Henry, but you've been receiving so many benefits and government benefits over your career that there's some welfare queens out there that are probably jealous. Andy? <laughs> Both of you have suggested helping seniors by lowering their, ta lowering their tax burdens, you know, such as expanding the homestead extend, uh, exemption, adding tax breaks for uh, long-term care insurance premiums, and el eliminating state taxes on retirement and pension income. But how do you balance that with the potential um, hurt uh, to revenue streams in the state, especially considering we're still trying to recover from the recession uh, with, with the budget, and also that we do have a lot of needs with schools and with roads? Uh, is that the right Andy? Andy? Thank you so much, Andy. Sorry. You know, we, we talked about our third, a third, a third plan. We called it a special reserve fund that we actually sponsored uh, this year. Um, so we've talked about various issues. And to get back to the money of this, I tell people all the time that if we expand Medicaid, that's 11 billion of our tax dollars coming back home, 10% of which actually belong to the Greenville Hospital System and all my good conservative friends in the upstate. So that is a way that we can do that. But if we start creating jobs like the 40,000 40, jobs that actually come when we expand Medicaid, these people will have income. It expands our tax base. There are ways we can pay for it. And the last thing we have to do, and I, I've been so frustrated, one of the reasons that I'm running to change South Carolina is our prioritization. We don't prioritize seniors. We don't prioritize our public school. We don't prioritize our public roads and bridges. And one thing I want to make sure that we do is work with Hugh Leatherman and Brian White, the chairman of our two budget committees, and go in and advocate for those tax credits that we talked about. And Henry and I actually agree on the in, uh, increasing the, the homestead exemption, but I want to go in and advocate for that. I'm going to be an advocate for the seniors of South Carolina, not just an advocate with volunteer ideas, but an advocate with vision for the future. Well, yeah. in states throughout this country, the volunteer spirit is strong and it is strong here. When I was in the Attorney General's office, I learned a lesson about volunteers. We did not have enough prosecutors in the state to prosecute criminal domestic violence cases. They just weren't there. I did go to the legislature one time and got money to, to fund prosecutors in every county, but that was not a sustainable program. So what we did is we turned to volunteers. We had lawyers in this state who were willing to prosecute those cases. And we asked them if they would volunteer, we'd appoint them special prosecutors and they would go into the courts and prosecute these cases. We had about 45 over, over all those years and, and still have a large number today. And what did they do? We trained them, we equipped them, we sent them in and they prosecuted those cases, resulting in hundreds, even thousands of convictions that we would not have gotten before. That's the, that is the spirit of volunteerism that we can use. We can't, we can't look away from that. Expanding government is not the idea. It is not a good idea. That's a bad old idea. And the, the, my opponent is talking about depending on Medicaid that Medicaid program to provide jobs for South Carolinians, well, my friends, those jobs are not sustainable. That's not the way to do it. That grows government. We need jobs through good, honest work and not a bureaucratic program that will not work for the future. And I, I will chime in here and take my 30 seconds to, to, to rebut that. But let me tell you what those jobs look like. Those jobs are in Bamberg County, the home of Bakari Sellers, the home of Nikki Haley 
or when you actually drive into Bamberg County and you pull up at the hospital, there's a sign that says, in case of emergency, dial 911 because our hospital closed in 2012. Those are jobs. Jobs are Chesterfield County, which has already said that they're going to close their hospital in 2015. Those jobs are leaving. We need those jobs to be there in Chesterfield. Jobs are in Fairfield where they're cutting back day after day, week after week. Those are jobs. Those are the 40,000 jobs we'll bring back if we expand Medicaid. You may have a rebuttal too if you like. Since Mr. Well again, in if there. we're dependent on that program, which is one of the most inefficient there is, which with the Medicaid expansion under President o Obama, which I, I, I understand uh, my opponent it was his, 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 was his co-chairman years ago. I understand they think alike. I think like Ronald Reagan. He, he's my mentor. He's the one that I look to. And his experience showed us the things he did in this country was that you get the government out of it. What you, what you do is you turn the private sector loose. You reduce taxes. You want a small, limited government that does certain things well. It, it, expecting a program like an expanded Obamacare, Medicaid expanded through Obamacare that, that interferes with free enterprise, destroys that system, also chokes businesses and is inefficient, is, is a, a counterproductive program. Counting on that to provide jobs for our citizens is not a very wise program. I want to change subjects. I want to talk about ethics. Uh, General McMaster, as, as Attorney General, you chaired the Governor's Ethics Commission last uh, or earlier this year, a commission on which I served, uh, and Representative Sellers, you serve in the House. This is kind of a nod to your head question. Is it safe to assume that you're both disappointed with what took place in the past year in terms of not getting any legislative action? Well, that's not accurate either. Well, go ahead then. Well, we did get legislative action. In fact, I was on the subcommittee, I was on the committee, not the subcommittee, that actually voted it out. It actually passed the House of Representatives. I actually worked with the League of Women Voters and Lynn T. I went out in the lobby and met with John Kringle about ethics reform. And yes, I believe, I mean, I, I do believe that Henry McMaster and myself, we both believe that ethics reform needs to happen. But there was legislative action. It did make it out of the House, but it died in the Senate. And we need somebody who has the ability to work together, work across party lines to get that done. I should amend my question to say, Finality, I suppose, in, <laughs> no in that regard. Mr. McMaster? I don't call that action. I don't call what the legislature did, has done in the last several years, action of any kind. I know there's been a lot of talk, but talk and action are not the same thing. Halfway measures are not the same thing. What I am calling for, what our a commission called for is to have an independent body, an ethics commission that is independently appointed, that can be the judge of all the ethics rules from the local officials all the way up to the state officials, no longer exempting the state legislature. That would be action. And also to have income source disclosure. Those are the two keys of what we proposed. I think that anything short of that is a halfway measure, is not action. And I, I would say that if I'm elected, if I'm elected, that will be one of my priorities. That is one of the challenges, one of the biggest ones facing our state. If our own people don't have confidence in their government, if our own people think that people are on the tape, people in the House, people in the Senate, people anywhere, people at the local levels, if they think that they are not getting honest, fair service out of them, then that will stop growth. It will stop people from coming into South Carolina to set up business as well. One of the key things we must do is have a complete open change of our ethics laws so that they really mean something, and I'm prepared to do that. Okay. Bobby Harrell's plea agreement um, last week includes he's going to cooperate with state and federal authorities, and that suggests that the scrutiny of the General Assembly is going to continue. You know, what has the Harrell case taught you about changes that are needed in the ethics laws and also in campaign finance laws? Because he was, he did plead guilty to, uh, to misusing uh, his, um, some campaign funds. Uh, Mr. McMaster. Well, <clears throat> that, of course, is not a pleasant experience for the state. But the lessons uh, uh, th that we learned from that case are the same ones we've been learning for all these years. We, we've got to have, an in we have to have clear laws to begin with, and we don't have that now. But until we have an independent body, independent, that is 
that, that are people that are beholden to no one, that can rule on these questions for everybody, treat everybody the same. The way the rules are now, they exempt the legislators. We just can't have that. People do not trust a system where the General Assembly is exempt from, uh, from uh, questioning on uh, ethics violations except by the members of the committees in the House and the Senate. That won't work. What we did learn was if the judge of the Supreme Court made it clear that those violations are criminal. That is, that the Attorney General has the authority to prosecute them. And we went through some turmoil there getting back to that that we knew to begin with. But we've got to have strong ethics enforcement. It cannot be done any way except by having an independent group, an independent group that will, that's appointed in the right way to handle all of those investigations and all of the punishment. And if they're criminal, then the Attorney General can take over as well. But we've got to have that income disclosure as well. Without those two things, anything else that, the, that we do is virtually meaningless. Mr. Sellers. Henry kept referring to all these years, and I think that's the contrast that we're building. You know, all these years that Henry McMaster has been elected or been running for office or been a part of government or, or, or just, you know, getting a check from government, we've had ethical problems in South Carolina, but they haven't been fixed. We agree on the remedy. We, we definitely agree on the remedy. But one thing I'll tell you is that in October 1st of 2009, the Wall Street Journal ran a profile on Henry McMaster and pay-to-play politics. It wasn't some local blog. It wasn't some, some weekly newspaper. It was the Wall Street Journal, October 1st of 2009. So I'm not certain if the track record means something sometimes, but doesn't mean something today, or where we stand. If we're going to talk about ethics, it takes more than rhetoric. It takes more than rhetoric to fix the problems of the state. It takes vision and the ability to work together. You know, that, that Bobby Harrell situation was traumatic for the entire state of South Carolina. It was traumatic for the entire state of South Carolina. But what people fail to realize is we did not need Bobby Harrell to understand that we needed ethics reform. We did not need Bobby Harrell to understand we need ethics reform. And for anybody to sit on this stage or anywhere else and say, now that we had Bobby Harrell, I'm going to create a commission or be on a commission and we're going to fix all these problems, is being disingenuous at best. We need somebody with a vision and a track record. But let me follow up on that because you, you say you agree that the problems exist and what needs to be done. How achievable is that? I mean, the current Speaker of the House, Speaker Lucas, says it's, it's going to be his priority. Uh, but as you yourself des described, Mr. Sellers, uh, you got it through one house but not and, the other. And I, Has that equation changed? And I can tell you practically, one thing that I'm willing to do, because I was actually there, and one thing I'm willing to do when I'm the Lieutenant Governor is go and work with the Democratic Caucus and the Republican Caucus in the Senate to get something done. But in all honesty, the one thing that will pass, the one thing we have to get past first and sooner rather than later is income disclosures. I think that has to happen first. There's a reluctance am among my friends in the Senate to have an independent investiga investigatory body. And as much as Henry McMaster and I may say we want to do it until we're blue in the face, we'll be lying to the South Carolina people if we say that's something that we'll be able to run in and do on day one when we're lieutenant governor. But one thing I do believe we can do, I do believe there are enough good people in the Senate that want to get it done. I want to work with Paul Thurman. I want to work with Katrina Sheely and Nikki Setzler to get these things done. And I believe it's something we can do. Mr. McMaster, as, as, as Lieutenant Governor, you preside over the Senate. Uh, you said to, as Lieutenant Governor you'd make this a priority, but Lieutenant Governor is not necessarily a, a priority setting position unless you've got the, the mandate to do so. How do you get that? Well, you don't, you, you don't do that from presiding over the Senate. In presiding over the Senate, the, the Lieutenant Governor needs to be someone that the Senators trust, that they respect, someone they know someone who's had experience, because remember, you've got 46 senators in there, and they're powerful people, and they have their own ideas. But that's presiding over the Senate. The lieutenant governor, as I mentioned earlier, is the second highest office in the state and has a jurisdiction the same as the governor's. Those are the only two that have that jurisdiction. And one of the, one of the areas is in ethics. So what I have done, in, and I've got a record of doing this, I've gotten laws passed working with Democrats, working with Republicans on gang legislation, on environmental grand jury legislation, on criminal domestic violence de uh, legislation. And we set up, while I was in the, uh, uh, the Attorney General's office, we, by collaborating with, with others, we set up criminal domestic violence courts all across the state. 
using volunteers, using uh, judges at no cost. The stroke of a pen set those courts up at no additional cost to the taxpayer. I don't believe in putting more costs on the taxpayers, but we can get this done. It takes leadership. Over the years since 1990 with the with Lost Trust, we've had been playing around with the question of ethics. It's time to get it done and with the right leadership, with the right experience, I'm ready to get it done. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Either of you could become governor during your terms if you win next week. Why do you think you fit best into the top job? Mr. Sellers. Well, well thank you, um, Andy, for that question. And we've been getting that question a lot, both Henry and myself. Um, but for me, it's, a, it's that clear contrast that we've been building for this hour. You know, we stand on stage today, and again, I go back to a very specific point, that in Henry McMaster's 30 years in office, or 30 years in politics, he's never created a job for anyone other than himself. His own words were, I created jobs in jails and prisons. Well, that's not <laughs> what South Carolina is looking for. That is not what South Carolina is looking for. You know, we, we talk about passing ethics reform. We talk about fixing our CDV problems and those things, which only exacerbate it under his attorney generalship. But we talk about passing ethics reform. I think it takes someone who's actually passed a law in the General Assembly. We want to shoot holes in this argument that just because you run for office, it gives you experience. That does not give you experience, ladies and gentlemen. But not only do you have to have experience, but you have to have vision and leadership. One thing that would make me a good governor, Andy, is because at no point will I put myself before the state of South Carolina. We've come too far. We've made too much progress, but we still have yet a ways to go. I believe in this great state. I believe in its natural beauty. I believe its best years to still align for my good friend. Its best years are still ahead of us, but we can't get to its best years if we keep trying the same old worn out tactics. Give me a chance November 4th. Join me and let's turn the page on this hypocrisy. Let's turn the page on yesterday in South Carolina and let's get to those better years. We don't have to wait for another election. Mr. McMaster? Well, in my political life, I've, I've held two jobs. One is Ronald Reagan's first United States attorney back in the early 80s, and as your attorney general for eight years. Uh, in between, an unpaid job was working as party chairman, Republican party chairman for South Carolina for a number of years. What I believe in is limited government and lower taxes. I do not believe in expanding the scope of government, which is what my opponent does believe in. I don't believe in that. I don't think we need any more taxes. I think there are a lot of ways that we can get the same job done without raising taxes on the people. Ronald Reagan proved that when you cut taxes on people, cut taxes on workers, and let the spirit, the entrepreneurial spirit that exists in people go, what happens? You have more people working, although they're paying less taxes each. That is the way that I have attempted to help South Carolina. That is the way, that is what I believe in. I believe in the strength of the people of South Carolina, not in the government doing all of these things for all these people and expanding government. I think that the more government we have in areas where it has no business being, we do nothing but cut growth, cut jobs, and that adds to the misery of, these, of our people. So what I stand for is the kind of government, the kind of approach that Ronald Reagan stood for, not what President Obama stands for. A a Andy, um, just to chime in and take my 30 seconds, there are two things that are clear tonight. Um, one is that Henry McMaster is not Ronald Reagan, and the other is that I'm not Barack Obama. We clearly talked about creating jobs, and we clearly talked about the fact that Henry McMaster has created absolutely no jobs. One of the things that's most important as we move forward is understanding that at some point in South Carolina's time, we're going to have to turn the page. And that's all I'm asking that we do. We turn the page on yesterday and move forward. Senator, do you want to give a rebuttal? Sure, I want to turn the page. I want to make some progress. I mean, these, these ideas of bigger government and government taking care of everybody have been around forever and they're not working. I mean, they didn't work, they haven't worked in any country where they've, where they've been used. We certainly don't, don't need them here. I think that what we need, we need experienced, mature leaders with good judgment who are ready to accept the challenges facing us and to move South Carolina forward. I think that the, the, our best years are ahead, and I'm, I have those qualifications to serve as Lieutenant Governor, and I'm ready. How much of this race is about Nikki Haley and her administration's performance during her first term, and how would you work with her if she wins re-election? 
Mr. McMaster? Well, I've, I've worked with her already. I enjoy working with her. Uh, she's a breath of fresh air. Uh, she does not have a reverse gear. I mean, she goes forward. She's not scared of anything. And uh, I'm really proud. I think that some of the some of her harshest critics would probably say that the main the main thing she promised was an expanding economy and jobs and that she would work hard on economic development in South Carolina. And there is no doubt that she has delivered. Things have turned, things are coming our way, it's going to get better. If we don't mess it up with more rules and regulations in big government and Washington coming down with rules and regulations that that, uh, that handicap businesses here in this, this state, we can make great progress. Uh, I would enjoy working with her very much. As I say, we've worked before. I believe we work well together. And this would be the first time we'd really have a team, a governor and lieutenant governor who are going into office looking forward to working together for the people of this state. That's something uh, very good. Now, some have done it in the past here and there, but there's never been a real team that uh, we can remember, and I'm, I'm ready to be a part of that team and to get things done for these people. Mr. Sellers. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the governor and I don't have any personal animus towards each other. Uh, we would actually have a, a affable relationship, one where we could get along and have a, a, a good discourse. But when the governor vetoes $100 million going through our, to our K-12 system, I'm going to stand up and say that's wrong. When she vetoes $10 million to go to teacher pay raises, I'm going to stand up and say that's wrong. When she refuses to expand Medicaid, I'm going to stand up and say that's wrong. I mean, Henry McMaster probably believes in the governor's road plan. The irony in that is she ain't even give it yet. She's not going to give it until January. But we have $42 billion worth of backlog that no one has an idea about. So I'm going to stand up and say, you know what, governor? We need to have a plan and we need to make sure the voters know what that plan is. You know, I want people to understand that when I get in that office, we're not going to be bound by any party. We're going to be bound by the fibers that bind us together. That's our faith. That's our belief that our better days are ahead. That is our faith in South Carolina. Let me ask a slightly different question on this quest to be Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina because it, it is a bit of an odd duck situation. <laughs> You're running for a position that uh, some people don't totally understand and then the, it goes away at least in its current configuration and, and since people are skeptical about politicians' motives, not necessarily uh, to suggest there's anything ill-founded here, but people kind of know why are you doing this? What do you really want to be, Mr. Sellers? <laughs> what do I really want to be? That's a unique question. At the end of the day, um, there are two things I want to do. One is I want to change the world, and the other one is I want to make my, my mom and dad proud of me. Um, so that's what I want to do and what I want to be. But in this office, I want to be lieutenant governor. I really do, with all my fiber. I want to be somebody who is able to put those old ghosts of yesterday behind us. Um, who doesn't care about partisan politics or race or any of those things, but brings this state together. Um, that's what I want to do. I mean, if there, if there should be any hesitation about anybody's motives, um, Henry McMaster has run for, let me get this right, U.S. United States Senate, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, Attorney General, Governor, and now Lieutenant Governor. I mean, I don't know what may be next in his future, but for me, my future is South Carolina. And hopefully, January 15th, I'll be able to raise my right hand and my future will be as the Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina. And, and Mr. McMaster, you've run for this office before. He's, he's yes. correct in that regard. It is correct. And, and uh, Governor Haley will not be able to run again since she's running for a second term. So I guess the same question is, what do you really want to be? And why am I running? Is, do you, do you, well, do you, I want to yeah, be Lieutenant this, Governor. Is this positioning yourself to run for Governor again? That's a long way off. We got four years before that happens. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done right now for the people of this state. Um, I'm running because I love South Carolina. I, I mean, I think that's why everybody runs. I hope that's why they run. And I don't know of many ways to express one's love and, and pride in this state other than by running for office and wanting to be a part of it. Uh, I've, I've been in uh, elected and appointed, office, appointed four years as U.S. Attorney eight years as, as Attorney General, and I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I've worked with some of the most dedicated, brightest people around, but there are a lot more out there. 
that would like to get involved, but for whatever reason, they don't feel like they would be welcome or they don't think that it's the right arena. But if we can clean up the ethics in our state, that will encourage more people to get involved. So what I'd say is get involved. Politics is the art of the possible. You can get things done. There are ideas out there that, that are, would change things in South Carolina for the better. And I need to point out, I understand that government does not create jobs. My opponent refers to government creating jobs. Government doesn't create a single job. Government has never created a single job except for the government employees. Those are not the kind, that's not what we need. We, individuals who put their capital on the line and go to work and invest and take the risk, those are the people who create the jobs and those are the people we need to get in gear and turn that spirit loose so they can create those jobs. We're, we're getting towards the end. I want to make sure that, uh, that uh, Mr. Shane has another question here. You know, you've talked about, of course, the core of the job, which is working with the Office on Aging. You've also uh, talked a little bit about some things that you'd like to do in expanding the job, such as working on economic development. But what are some of the other issues that you would you think you could tackle if you are elected lieutenant governor? Maybe some of these issues where you talk about expanding uh, the responsibilities of the office or working with the governor. Uh, I believe it's uh, Mr. Selichar. Yeah, uh, let me just go back um, before I get to that. and. Um, you know, my opponent, Henry, just said the government doesn't create jobs. And my message to Henry would be that somebody needs to tell Hickey, Nikki Haley that. Uh, she's, she is taking her uh, tour around state uh, claiming uh, some of the same things I did. Um, but one of the things that I do want to focus on um, is our public school system in South Carolina, our K-12 through public school system in South Carolina. Um, just recently, I was at Sanders Clyde Elementary School, which is in the middle of the hood in Charleston. And I went and I spoke to a classroom full of journalists. They were actually better than you two. They were seven to 10 years old. And we talked and chatted, and those kids, it didn't matter their environment when they got out of that school. That school was beautiful. They had all the resources they needed. It was amazing. Those teachers did magnificent work at Sanders Clot. I was actually there at four o'clock. They had an extended day. They had uniforms. They fed those kids dinner. You know, when I thought about that, I said that maybe that is the roadmap that we need to use in Allendale. Maybe that's the roadmap we need to use in McCormick or Greenwood or Abbeville. But one thing I want to do as Lieutenant Governor, beyond the offices on aging and that initial responsibility, is I'm going to be a beacon for the public school system in South Carolina. I'm going to be a beacon for K-12 education. And I want to make sure that we have an elected official in the executive branch that actually cares about public school education. And I'll be that. Mr. McMaster? Well, the list is long uh, on the things that I'd like to do. One is with criminal domestic violence. I've had experience there working with groups around the state and we've made a lot of progress and we've gotten some laws passed and made things better, but it's not nearly good enough. We need to enhance that. I'd like to work on tax reform with the governor. At some point, our senior citizens have paid enough in taxes. At some point, they, they get to where they don't have enough money to, to stay in their own homes. I want our senior citizens to, to be able to stay in their own homes is, is safe, happy, and secure as long as they can. And that means some tax reform we're going to have to have. We're going to need tax. We've got to take this, the big tax off of manufacturers. That's something that's holding them back. Some states that don't even have, uh, don't even have an income tax. Texas, Alaska, Wisconsin, I think, uh, South Dakota, or North Dakota, Florida, uh, so don't, don't even have income tax. We need to explore all of those things so we can find a way to have the tax money that we need in order to fix the roads, fix the bridges, and do those sorts of things. The whole, the whole panoply of challenges is out there, but I believe that South Carolina has the right spirit, the right attitude to get all of this done and to be a model for the country, and I have the experience to work and get that done. Thank you. I think we've got time for one last question. Let me ask you this. I've got several here, so I'm going to have to pick from one. <laughs> um, what, what ultimately decides this race? I mean, there are two things that we've talked about or that have certainly come into the mix. Seniors because of the importance of the Office on Aging, um, and, and, and certainly underserved populations who don't get the health care, may not get the Medicaid, often are African Americans, but not certainly by any means uh, solely that. So in, in terms of what you need to win, Mr. Seller, starting with you, where's your vote going to come from? Well, if you listen to the Post and Courier or, or anybody else, they'll probably tell you I don't have a chance to win this race. 
I've been traveling and people tell me I can't win because I'm black, Charles. They say I can't win because I'm Democrat. They say I can't win because I'm young. Then they tell me I can't win because I'm a young black Democrat. And it's okay. Um, we have a pathway to victory, but it, it relies on this clear contrast. It relies on this fact that you have someone who's run for office multiple times and call that experience or, or whatever you may, but doesn't have a vision for the future. I, I, I chuckled the other day when I said that Henry's gray hair doesn't denote leadership and vision. It simply doesn't. You know, I have a vision for this great state. I've actually served two years longer in the General Assembly than Governor Nikki Haley did, someone who Henry McMaster now adores. So all I'm asking for is a chance. I'm asking for it because I believe, I tell people often, my, my two favorite South Carolina politicians are Carol Campbell and Dick Riley. It's Dick Riley because nobody's done, nobody's done for education what Dick Riley did, and it's Carol Campbell because he was able to look inside of people, no matter their race or party, and give them justice. I want to make sure Mr. McMaster has the same amount of time to answer this. What's going to make this, uh, what, what's your winning combination? Well, to get the most votes. Well, that works. Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the people realize that we're, we're, in, we're at a crossroads because the economy is coming back. Power companies tell me they're getting calls from people all over the country wanting to know about the power rates here. What can they do? They want to come to South Carolina. Nobody comes to South Carolina and ever leaves. We've got a very bright future ahead of us. I want to be a part of it. But I think what people are looking for, I think people realize that the next four years are going to be critical. We've got to get our ethics straight. We've got to get our, our tax structure straight. We've got to take great strides on, on education. We've got to work on criminal domestic violence. We've got to get the Office on Aging going. It is a gray tsunami, just like Glenn McConnell said. And by the way, uh, most of those people who need that help do have some gray hair, uh, like I do. But I think what they're looking for is experience and a, and a track record. Someone who has actually gotten major legislation passed, who was the leader getting it passed, who's implemented it, and who's gotten things done, important things for the state of South Carolina. Thank I'm the man with that record and that experience. Thank you. We've squeezed every second out of this. I want to thank both candidates as well as uh, Andrew Shane from the state. Uh, thank you for more information on all the ETV debates, go to visit uh, or go to SCETV.org. Now for everyone at ETV here this evening, I'm Charles Beardman. Thank you. Good night.